things nobody told me to do. So Ephesians chapter 2. By the way, I'm happy to say that I've got my wife home. Somebody said this morning, said, wow, you're all, you're all color coordinated today. <laughs> my wife is home. <laughs> all right. I tried to wear a bow tie this morning. She wouldn't let me. Huh? Ephesians chapter 2. We're, we're looking at verse number 8 and 9. And I, I want to I just do one little quick thing with you today and maybe have to finish it next week but so it won't be so quick. But there, there's, a, there's an issue here in these verses. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That passage is often quoted. We, we quote it not so much in its context, but we, we take it for the truth that it is. And we, we've been studying the context and why Paul does, you know, brings it in here and what it's all about. Because this passage, the first 10 verses of this passage, Pastor O'Hare used to call it God's grace factory. And it, it's, it's a demonstration of, how, of the material and the, and the process whereby God is forming the church, the body of Christ. And verse 8, 9, and 10 are sort of the capsulization of, of what he said. For by grace are you saved, through faith. And that by grace through faith plus nothing is, is the idea. There's no works involved in it. By grace you're saved through faith that not of yourself. It doesn't come from inner resources that reside in you. You don't have to look within yourself and pull out some kind of strength and resources. Your weakness is where his strength is made perfect. Not of works. It's, it, uh, it's, the, it's the gift of God, not of works. In other words, it isn't something that you're going to externally, just like you don't internally have the resources to, to, to provide salvation, you don't externally go out and perform some external religious duties and ceremonies and performance. It's not the outward activity that, that you perform that, that results in salvation. It's the gift of God. Now, if it's a gift, it's not of yourself. It's not of your works. If it's a gift, it's free. And I've said to you many times, a gift is a, it's a free gift. That's what we looked at the verses in Romans 5 where he calls it a free gift. You know, a, a gift is something that someone pays for, but they give it to you and you don't pay for it. It didn't mean it's cheap. It didn't mean it wasn't paid for. It just meant you didn't pay for it, and it's given to you as a gift. And the only, there are only two things you can do, one or two things you can do with a gift. You can either receive it or you can reject it. You can't pay for it. Somebody else already paid for it. And when, you, when a gift is given to you, the only thing you can do to possess it is to receive it. Now, when you receive the gift, when someone offers you a gift, it puts you under an obligation. You ever thought about that? If they offer you a gift, it obligates you to either say yes or no, thank you or no thank you. I remember that verse in 1 John where he says, we love him, why? Because he first loved us. You see, the issue isn't how much you love him, the issue is how much he loves you. But when you come to understand the love of Christ for you, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ does what? Constrains us. There is a, there, there, there is a, 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 a constraining. There's something in God's love for you that requires, that calls for a response from you. We love him because he first loved. His love for us is what stirs our love for him. His love for us is what constrains us, picks us up and carries us along. So it's his love is the, and his grace is the, the source. By grace, the source of everything is what God is free to do for you through the finished work of Christ, grace. By grace you are saved through faith. The avenue, the channel by which you receive what God's given you is faith. Now, faith is the only thing that you can do. Sometimes we say salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. And that's true in the sense of no works. But it isn't true in the sense that you don't do anything. Look with me in Acts 16. Some people, sometimes people get a little, little you know, in, the, in their theology they say, there, and, and we, I'll say this to you sometimes, there's nothing you can do. 
And that means there's nothing in yourself that you can rely on. There's no works that you can perform, but you do have to do something to get saved. You don't get saved by just being. It isn't an automatic thing. Acts, 13, Acts 16, verse 30, the Philippian jailer asked Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, what does he say? The answer is swift and positive in its content. He says, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. What must I do to be saved? Not just sit there and do nothing in the sense of no response at all. I need to do the one thing that is not a work. You with me? I believe. Now come with me to Romans chapter 4 so that you, you grasp this clearly. Because this, this is a tremendously important issue that gets confused and confusing in people's minds. Religion just won't get this. Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter 4, verse number 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you're going to work, what you get for it isn't grace. But to him that works not, but does what? Believes on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Faith is something you do. It's something you, you make a positive choice to trust. If you look down at verse number 20, talking about Abraham, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. What did he do when he was strong in faith? Being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Abel, Abel, Abraham, he had some words from God, a promise from God, and, and he had a commitment from God that he spoke to him, and all Abraham had to, had to trust was what God said. He couldn't look at himself, his ability, to confirm the fact. He couldn't look at Sarah. He, his body couldn't perform. Sarah's body couldn't perform. And yet God said, you're going to have a son. He only had God's word. So what did he do? He trusted God's word. He's fully persuaded that what God had promised, what He had said, He was able to perform. Faith is simply trusting what God says. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Faith is not something you go in the closet and muster up. Faith isn't something you say, oh, Lord, help me have faith. Faith is, faith is you either trust what God says or you don't. And when you trust what God says, it's not a work. <laughs> it's the only thing you can do because it's the only thing that you can do that is not a work. If you look back at Romans chapter 3, <coughs> whee, excuse me, <laughs> Romans 3 verse 27, where is the boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. You see, if it's by faith, there's no way for you to boast. So when people tell you, well, you know, if, you if salvation is re the result of your trusting in Christ, then you sa who saved you, him or you? He did. That's the answer. You say, but you had to do something. Yep, you had to do something that is the only thing you can do without it being a work, only thing you could do in which there's no merit attributed to you. All the boasting, the merit is excluded. Why? By the law of, work, of faith, not works. There's, faith says all the merit is in the one I'm believing and trusting. Now that issue of faith being the only thing it's the only response grace will accept. If you look down at chapter 4 in Romans, verse number 16, 
Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise is sure. Boy, that's a great verse. It's by faith that it might be by grace. The only response grace will accept from you is faith. Because faith is not your, it's not, it's not you working, it's you trusting what he said. Faith is also the necessary response. It's the required response. The only response grace will accept is faith, but grace requires the response of faith. Because if you don't respond in faith, grace doesn't get applied. See, this is not an automatic against your will kind of a thing. So it's by grace through faith, that not of ourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Oftentimes when we're when I'm sharing with people the gospel, and I even here when I'm talking in a, in, a, in a meeting, I'll tell people you don't have to go anywhere, you don't have to move a muscle, you don't even have to pray. And the reason I say that is because you don't have to pray to get saved. You know what you, do to, you, know what you have to do to get saved? You have to believe. Now, that's an important issue, frankly. Years ago, I made that statement down at the Pacific Garden Mission and got some people really mad at me. <laughs> Because, well, you've got to pray the sinner's prayer. And that's the common religious idea. You hear people say, well, he prayed the sinner's prayer and got saved. No, no, you don't pray the sinner's prayer and get saved. You believe and get saved. People say you need to repent and turn from your sins to get saved. You don't repent and turn from your sins to get saved. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved. People say you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Make him Lord of your life. No, you need to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again for your justification. That's what you need to do. All this other stuff is just a bunch of religious confusion. People say, well, you need to confess your sins and turn from your sins. And you think, why would you tell a lost man to do something he can't do? The only thing a lost person can do without working is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this religious confusion that is encapsulated in this pray the sinner's prayer kind of thing, you need to develop a discerning ear about these issues. And let me show you. There's a great verse back in the book of Job. Let me just, just um, Job chapter 34. When Job is, and his buddies of his friends, I call them his buddies, they're not his buddies, but he called them miserable comforters. <laughs> and they were. They were his daddy's friends. But um, when Elihu begins to speak in Job 34, he says in verse number 3, For the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. And I've always thought that was a great, a great thing to remember. Your mouth can taste meat. You taste a hamburger and you know it's, well, you know where, you know where it came from. You know it's McDonald's or you know you, your mama made it. Somebody gave me a thing the other day. You seen that thing on TV, that smash thing where they, where you, it's an infomercial where, they, where you got this thing and they, I forgot what they call it now, but they, you put the hamburger meat in it and smash it together and then it open it up and then you put the cheese and all kind of stuff inside and you stuff it together and that kind of thing and, and, and you make a big old fat hamburger with all this, all this gook inside of it, you know. And, uh, well, okay. Then you take a piece of chicken take a piece of fish, and you can taste the difference in it, okay? Um, as the, your ear is designed to try words, you're supposed to have a discernment in your listening capacity when you hear things taught, where you can discriminate between them, just like your mouth can discriminate between a piece of, uh, of, of bologna and a T-bone steak, just like you can taste the difference between a piece of squash and a piece of, uh, uh, and a fig, you know the difference by tasting them. You're, you, you have to develop a discernment of the, your, your ear is able to tell differences in messages. If you go to Galatians chapter 3, one of the things that caused Galatianism, the mixing of law and grace, was they lost that ability to distinguish between the messages they were hearing. Galatians chapter 3, when he says, O foolish Galatians, 
Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Notice they started well. Before their eyes, Jesus Christ was evidently crucified. It was when they started their Christian life, it was as though they were there watching the Lord be crucified. It was that clear and plain and simple to them. They grasped it to that depth. It was a reality in their thinking. They knew about it. They believed it. They trusted it. And it was set forth before them. And the doctrine had an impact on them. And they had an understanding of what took place at Calvary. But now, he says, you're foolish. Now, that word foolish doesn't mean dumb, stupid, and ignorant. It means you quit using your head. <laughs> A foolish person isn't somebody whose IQ is down around the 27 mark. A foolish person is someone who I, whose IQ may be at the 250 mark. I don't even know if you can get that high. <laughs> But, I mean, you can have a brilliant IQ, but not have the ability to think through the common issues of life. Old foolish guys, they had become dull in their own, they'd been bewitched. They'd let somebody come along and trick them, cast a spell over them, make them not use their thinking processes properly. And if you go back to chapter 1, you'll see how it happened. Chapter 5, he says, This persuasion cometh, cometh not of him that calls you. They had been persuaded. They'd had some thinking process put upon their understanding that had clouded their vision of Calvary, clouded their understanding of the sound doctrine of grace that they began with. Chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Who called him into the grace of Christ? Paul did. They've been removed from Paul. Chapter 4, he says, they, 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 these people that have troubled you want to exclude you. They want to separate you away from me. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some which trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They want to come in and twist and rest the gospel. They want to come in and turn it on its head and pervert it. And you know what had happened? The Galatians had allowed them to. They came in and were preaching a Je about Jesus, but it was another Jesus. They came in preaching a gospel, but it was a, another gospel. They came pre in preaching a, a, a spirit about the Holy Spirit, but it was a, another spirit. You remember the verse in 2 Corinthians 11. And the Galatians weren't able to distinguish in their hearing the difference. That kind of an idea prevails in Christendom today. Well, if they're talking about Jesus, it must be right. If they're talking about the Bible, it must be right. If they're praying the sinner's prayer, it must be right. <laughs> and what that is is just religious tomfoolery. It's religious confusion. And that idea about praying the sinner's prayer encapsulizes that, that lack of clarity about the gospel, and about grace. And we're talking here about just the issues of salvation. We're not, just talk, we're not talking about the Christian life and functioning in the Christian life. You have to get salvation first. And when you lose the issue of grace, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. It isn't what you do, it isn't your resources, it's your trusting in what He's done. When you lose that, you lose any capacity to have your Christian life function at all because you've tra transferred all of your dependence from Him to yourself or to others. Come with me to Luke chapter 18. This thing about the sinner's prayer comes from a, an account in Luke chapter 18 that Jesus taught. It's a parable. Luke chapter 18 Verse number 9, and he spake this parable unto, unto, uh, unto certain, notice, which tr trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Notice who he's talking to, people who trusted in themselves, people who thought it wasn't by grace through faith plus nothing not of myself. <laughs> Here's people trusting in their resources. 
looking down on others. He says this, verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within it with himself. Don't you love that? Here's a guy praying. Who's he praying to? <laughs> He's just talking to himself. God? Well, who do you think was God? If he's praying to himself, who's he talking to? Who does he call himself? See how screw this gets? God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Woo-hoo, I'm doing good. Look at me. And the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What I want you to see is that thing in verse number 13. There's the sinner's prayer. The publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but he smote on his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What he's saying there. Is, 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 is extremely important, and from a Jewish perspective, it's very clear. When he says, God be merciful to me, there was a place in that temple called the mercy seat. You remember that? In the Holy of Holies, there was, a, there was that little, little coffin, that little box, that ark, in which the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments were kept, and the Aaron's rod that budded, and the pot of manna, and over that, that was that golden lid with the cherubim on either side, and on that golden lid was called the mercy seat because once a year the high priest would go into that temple and take blood in there and spread, pour that blood upon that mercy seat and that blood, the presence of God above the mercy seat, the broken law in the, in, in the, in the, uh, uh, the, 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 the ark, and that blood would stand between the presence of God and the broken law and it would make an atonement. And, Leviticus 17, he says that the blood is upon the altar is for the atonement of your soul. And what that man was, look, was doing as he stood there, he was looking at that temple, and he doesn't even lift up his eye. He says, I know I have no, no, I have no merit of myself. Lord, remember the blood on the mercy seat. And the mercy comes from the blood on the mercy seat, trusting the blood of, in Israel from Genesis 3. Israel understood the issue of sacrifice. When God took the animal out, slayed the, slew the animal, and shed the blood of an animal and put clothing upon Adam and Eve, that issue for Israel all through the Bible is very clear. And what that publican was doing back there was he was literally pleading the blood on the mercy seat. So when people talk about praying the sinner's prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and have no idea what they're doing or why God would be merciful to them, that, the, the idea of the sinner's prayer really is pointing to the blood. And so the idea of just saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a, a sinner, and thinking that that praying of those, that prayer is going to save somebody without believing in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is foolishness. It's religious tomfoolery. It's religious confusion. And the reason it's that way, come back with me if you will to the book of Colossians is that when you think about prayer and praying, praying won't save you because in the Bible, prayer is a work. And when you tell somebody to pray the sinner's prayer or you give them a prayer to recite after you or you tell them to pray and, and, and ask God to save them, listen, when you pray, you're telling them, when you tell them to pray, you're telling them to work. Because in the Scripture, prayer is a work. 
And salvation is not of works. So it's not of prayer. The reason prayer won't save you is because prayer is a work. The reason the sinner's prayer doesn't work is because prayer is a work. <laughs> okay? And that's important to grasp. What did I tell you? Colossians 4.12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Epaphras was the pastor, one, one of the elders of the, of the church at, 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 uh, at, Phil, at, at Colossae. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. He was with Paul. Always watch, laboring fervently for you in visitation and Bible study. No. What was he laboring fervently for them in? Prayer. Well, if he's laboring in prayer, then prayer is a labor. Okay? Come with me to Romans 15. That's the verse right there that, got, that caused such a problem at the mission that time. <laughs> Romans 15, verse number 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. You see, prayer is one of the good works that believers perform. Okay? Come with me to 1 Timothy and watch how he calls it that. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verse Timothy 5, beginning in verse 5, he talks about the widow. Now, 1 Timothy 5, verse 5, Now she that is a widow indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. That widow that is a widow indeed, that trusts God, that continues in supplications and prayers night and day, verse number 10, verse number 9, says, let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been, been the wife of one man, well reported of for what? Good works. Well, what are the, some of the good works that she did? Well, part of the identification of her good works back in verse 5 is that she continued in supplications and prayers night and day. Praying is one of the good works that believers do. Okay? The reason prayer doesn't save you is because prayer is the function of a believer. Now come back with me to John chapter 9 because that will help you understand this verse back here. John chapter 9. Is, is the account of the, the blind man that Jesus heals. He's the guy that says in verse 25, he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. <laughs> Jesus heals the blind man. The Pharisees come along and they said, this guy did it? Don't you know he's a sinner? The blind man says, I don't, you know, I can't get into your theological discussion about that. All I know is before he showed up, I was blind. And now I can see. Now, if he's a sinner or not, you figure that out. All I know is I couldn't see. Now I can. <laughs> Miracle. Everybody around me knows it. They won't tell you, but they all know it. Now, verse 31. Now, verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. I, I, this guy is, he is killing these Pharisees. I mean, he's got something real, and, and they're, 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 they're just arguing with you. Go, go back and start reading verse 26. He says, verse 25, one thing I know that the words I was blind now I see. And they said unto him again, uh, what, did he, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he answered them, I, I have... Already told, I've told you already, and you did not hear. 
wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Ooh. I mean, I already told you once. Well, you will know again. You, you won't believe this time? Well, he knew they didn't. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God speaketh unto, spake, uh, spake unto Moses, but for this fellow we know not from whence he is. And the men answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing. You know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. You guys say you know you, you know what Moses said. You, he performed the miracle that Moses said that the Messiah would perform, and you don't know who he is. Isn't that marvelous? I wonder who's really the blind guy. Now we know, verse 21, 31, that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doth his will, him he heareth. Now you take that verse at face value. Why would you tell a lost man to pray if God doesn't hear sinners? Who does God hear? He hears believers. Okay? The problem with praying is that prayer is a good work for believers. And to tell a lost man that he needs to pray the sinner's prayer or any other prayer to be saved is to tell him to work when you need to tell him to believe. Now come with, somebody immediately says, but Brother Rick, what about whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Some of you already thought about that. Then come with me to Romans 10. In almost every track, in almost every gospel presentation that you'll hear an evangelical fundamental gospel preacher preach, he'll use Romans chapter 10 as the closer. You won't find those tracks out in our lobby out here, but you go most any, any uh, I, I picked up two in the last week at, 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 uh, at places, gospel tracks. And the closing in the gospel track will be Romans 10, verse 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Can I tell you that that is, 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 a, is, a, uh, is a mark of a lack of understanding. That's a mark that your ear ought to catch just like that because of the confusion that it causes. Now somebody says, well, what about, what about Romans 10, 13? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's a great verse, isn't it? And you know what it means? It means exactly what it says. But did you notice verse 14? How then shall they call on him in whom they have what? Not believe. And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear except to be a preacher? And how shall they preach except to be sent? There's an order to this thing. First the guy gets sent, then he preaches, then they hear, and when they hear, they do what? They believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And when they believe, then what do they do? They call. So whosoever shall call, who's calling? Who's the whosoever in verse 13? Well, according to verse 14, you don't call until you believe. And when you believe, what happens to you? Look at verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto what? Righteousness. And with a mouth, confession is made to salvation. The first thing you do is you believe, and when you believe, you get righteousness. You know what that's called? That's called justification. When you get the righteousness of God when you believe, you didn't get it because you prayed, confessed, worked, gave up, held out, let go of. You got it because you believed God's Word. You trusted God's Son. You believed in Jesus. You believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody says, Does work, do, do works justify you? No. Does your faith justify you? No. Who justifies you? Romans 8, 33, it's God that justifies. The only person that can declare you righteous is God. And when you believe, 
When you obey from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivered to you, he that believeth from the heart, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. There, look folks, if the justice of God has declared you righteous, you are justified. And if you're justified, then he can give you eternal life. He bless you with all blessings and put you in Christ, make you complete in him. You got it all right that instant. And the natural response of a person who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ would be to do what? If I give you a gift, what do you, what do you just instinctively say? Thank you. My wife's been writing thank you notes for a couple of weeks. People kindly give us things at Christmas time. We give people things. And when you give someone a gift or they give you a gift, you instinctively write and say thank you. That's the natural response. It's a natural thing for someone who believes then to thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. That's a natural thing. But it's believers that call upon the name of the Lord. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Paul called him an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them which are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, watch, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Believers call upon the name of the Lord. But they're not calling on the name of the Lord to get saved. They're calling on the name of the Lord because they are saved. So the issue isn't prayer. The issue is believing. Now come back with me to Romans chapter number 10. And run back up, if you will, to verse number 9. Because this is the part of the passage that really gets, gets played. I've talked to preachers for years, for 40-something years that I've been preaching and ask preachers about this passage. You just don't find preachers that understand this passage. They'll quote it and they'll use it because it helps them get people down the aisle. It helps them make the public profession so they can count them. But they don't understand it. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let me ask you something. You see anything about the cross in that verse? Well, the resurrection, he had to die before he was resurrected, but there's no cross, there's no blood in that verse, no cross in that verse. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that verse is quoted constantly and said, that's how you get saved. Now, the first thing we're going to do is look at verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Notice the order is very clear. What happens first? Your heart believes and you get righteous. You're justified. After you're a justified person, your mouth naturally will confess what your heart understands. Out of the mouth, the abundance of the heart speaks. And makes confession, the mouth is with confession is made unto salvation. But notice that's not salvation. To get to, to, to become justified, that's a salvation in addition to being justified. You follow that? With the heart man believes unto righteousness, there's justification. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And that salvation is something beyond justification. Because you already got justification whether your mouth said anything or not. All of a sudden, you say, well, maybe I better study a little bit. What a concept. Because it's not just like falling off a log. That verse, that verse can get confusing to people. Now, by the way... It, Think about this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus tells in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
okay? It's talking to Israel about Israel's program. And it said, the first thing is the righteousness of God. How are you going to have that? You're going to believe. Abraham, believe God. is counted him for righteousness. You have to have faith in God's Word to you. But when Israel believed God, then there was a whole salvation package of thing, these things, the, 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 the material possessions that he's talking to them there in Matthew 6 about, those, the physical kingdom thing would be added to them. What came first? Righteousness. Then there was more to come for them after that. It's the same principle here. First they believe, and then there's the mouth that confession is made into salvation that's in addition to justification. There's more to their package. They say, why is that important? Look back at verse number 9. That if thou confess, who is the thou? Well, look back at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for all the world is that they be saved. No. See Romans 10.1? Who's he talking about? He's talking about the salvation of the nation Israel. If you go back to chapter 9, verse 1, I say the truth of Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Notice he didn't say I could wish myself accursed by Christ, but from Christ. Why? For my kinsmen. That's exactly the position the nation Israel is in in the dispensation of grace. That's exactly the position Paul is telling Israel that they're in. Chapter 11, it says, Through the fall of Israel, salvation is going to the Gentiles. If the casting away of them is riches of the world, Israel has been set aside. They've been cut off. They're no longer God's chosen people in the dispensation of grace. And in Romans 9, 10, and 11, you have a, a section. Alex is teaching Romans in the first session, and he's talking to you about the first five chapters being about justification. This morning he's talking to you about chapter 6, 7, and 8 being a unit about sanctification in the Christian life. And then chapter 12 to 16 about the practical aspects. Chapter 9 to 11 in the book of Romans is talking about the nation Israel and the dispensational setting. And the missing element in modern theology, Israelology, they'll talk about hamartology and anthropology and angelology and, 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 and uh, soteriology and ecclesiology and eschatology and all these ologies, but nobody ever has a, has a department on Israelology. Paul did. Three whole chapters where he explains what's happened to Israel in, 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 in light of the change of program. God didn't finish with them. He's going to finish his program with them. In fact, when he says in chapter 10, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they, that they might be saved. Look at chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Israel has been blinded until the dispensation of grace is over, and so all Israel shall be what? Saved, watch, as it is written. We live in a mystery age that wasn't pre-prophesied, but what God wrote in prophecy about saving the nation Israel, He's going to perform once this age is over with. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant of that, lest you don't know what's going on. So Paul knew that Israel would be saved according to prophecy. That's what he says. Well, then what's he talking about back in chapter 10 when he's wishing they'd get saved? If he knows they're going to be saved, then now he's, his heart's desire is that they be saved. Is his heart desire that dispensation of grace in and prophecy start? No, it's not what he's talking about at all. What he's talking about is down in chapter 11 of Romans. Just start in verse number 11. I say then, have they, that's Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Notice why he says salvation went to the Gentiles. He's not talking about it going to the Gentiles to form the body of Christ in this passage. That's true, but that's not the issue here. Here, Paul's talking about salvation going to the Gentiles and what it means to Israel at the time. And he sends salvation to the Gentiles to provoke Israel, lost, unsaved Israel, the rest, back in verse number 
uh, 7, when he says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. What about those blinded lost Jews out there? Paul said, Salvation going to the Gentiles to provoke those lost Jews out there to jealousy. For if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Watch. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Some of, Paul says, I'm conducting my Gentile apostleship in a way that, that will provoke lost Jews to see that the only hope they have is in what I'm preaching. And that's what Paul was do, doing during the book of Acts. Now go back to Romans 10 and notice that's what he's talking about here in Romans. Romans chapter 10. Uh, I look at the clock. Start in verse 10. I, I don't read these verses anyway. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now, the man with the heart man believes unto righteousness. Here's the righteousness of faith. Not Moses. But here's the righteousness of faith. It says, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up. That's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 30. That's what Moses said. But you notice those parentheses? Verse 6, Who shall ascend into heaven? Parenthesis. That is to bring Christ down. Paul adds that parenthesis. That's not in Deuteronomy. And what Paul is saying, he said, you know what? Jesus said it. He said, Moses wrote of me. Search the Scripture there that testified me. Moses wrote of me. And if you'd have believed Moses, you'd have believed me. You know why you didn't believe me? You didn't believe Moses. I'm the Word of God. Moses gave you the Word of God. If you were believing the Word of God through Moses, you'd have believed the Word of God when he showed up because you're in the business of believing the Word of God. You guys aren't believing the Word of God. See, when he showed up, you didn't believe him. Paul quotes Deuteronomy that they're quoting, they're saying these verses over and over. Verse 8, he says, what, says, what saith it? What is righteous to say? The Word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. These Jews had God's Word in their heart, and God's Word that was in their heart spoke of Christ. Pointed to Him. Chapter 9, verse 32. Wherefore, verse 31. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness and not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Whosoever believeth in him should not be ashamed. Israel, unbelieving Israel, stumbled. Why? Because they didn't believe God's word. So Paul says, look. All you lost Jews out there, I want you to get saved. I understand what's going on. You st you, God's Word said this, and you were quoting God's Word. That was pointing to Christ. But you didn't believe in Him because you didn't believe God's Word. It's right there in your mouth. <laughs> it's right there hidden in your heart. You've got these verses. You just need to believe what the Word said. Then he says in verse 8, at the end of it, he says, that is the word of faith which we preach. Here's what Paul, you ever wonder what Paul was preaching in the synagogues when he went around between Acts 9 and Acts 28, preaching in those synagogues? People read the book of Acts, try to figure out what he's preaching. Paul tells you what he's preaching in the synagogues in Romans 10. You don't need to read Acts 17, Acts 13, Acts 18, Acts 19 to figure out what he's preaching in the synagogues. He tells you right here what he preached. Luke's telling you what he preached back there about something else. What did he preach to those Jews in the synagogue? That's my point here. 
verse 9, 10, 11, 12, that's, talk, that's Paul's message to the Jews in the synagogue when he's trying to provoke them to trust Christ. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy... There were two great issues the Jews had. One, they didn't believe he was the Messiah. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... Get two passages. Get John chapter 8 in one hand and 1 Kings chapter uh, 8. John 8. And 1 Kings chapter 8. In 1 Kings chapter 8, I'm going to just use this verse because it's easy to use. You could start in Leviticus 26. God required Israel to confess. To get out from under that fifth course of judgment, Leviticus 26, beginning at verse 40, says they had to confess their sin, their breaking of the covenant, and they had to confess Him as their Savior. Solomon, when he dedicates the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, Verse 33, wherefore thy people Israel be, oh, I'm sorry, when thy people Israel be smitten down from the enemy because they have sinned against thee and they turn from their, uh, they turn to thee and confess what? Thy name and pray. Verse 35, when the heavens is shut, and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee if they pray toward thy place and confess thy name. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. You see, that's what Israel was to do. They were to recognize when he says confess thy name. That's Jehovah. Confess him as the one who's going to provide for them what they couldn't do for themselves. He'll be their Messiah, Savior, their Redeemer. John chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus talking to the Pharisees. John 8, 24. I say therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am He, you should die. And if you don't believe that I am Jehovah, that I'm the Messiah, I'm the Redeemer, you see, a Jew had no problem with the issue of a blood sacrifice. They did it all along. They just believed Jesus wasn't the Messiah. They believed he was a counterfeit. So the first issue with the lost Jew was he needed to recognize that Jesus Christ was God's Messiah, God's Redeemer, the real deal. And the other thing, you go back to Romans 10, verse number 9, and... Believe in that heart that God raised him from the dead. The other thing that a Jew had, those lost Jews in, in back there had a problem with, was the resurrection. They believed it was just a big hoax, just a rumor. You remember the story in Matthew 18, um, Matthew 28, that the, fair, that the chief priest told the soldiers to say, go out and say that his disciples came and stole him, and they spread that abroad. That was the answer that everybody had to the resurrection. Now, the resurrection is the, is the testimony to the identity of the Savior. And what he's telling them is, you know what you need to do? You need to recognize who the Lord Jesus is. That's the issues that lost Jews faced. Now, those things aren't going to provoke a Gentile, but they would provoke Israel. So he says to them, verse 10, for, the, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You've got to notice the order clearly. The heart man believes under righteousness. If you sit down and do nothing else, you're justified. How do I know? What God said. The natural response would be that the mouth would make confession unto salvation. It would confess to the program that's going on. Verse 11, for the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Well, that's not true in time past in Israel's program, but it is true today. Now, you tell a Jew that, 
book of Acts, you know what he'd do? He went bonkers. Go back and read Acts 13 when Paul goes in and the whole the city hears about the, the, all the whole city comes together to hear the word and the Jews begin to contradict and blaspheme. Have a cat. Have a cow. Eat more beef. <laughs> And that's when, he's, when he says to him, it's necessary that the word of God be preached to you. But seeing you counted on you, yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. What's he doing? That's that provoking ministry. And that's what he's doing here. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's sticking it in their eye and says, see, the Gentiles are out there calling on him because they have believed on him. You ought to, too. My point to you is that if, if, you, if you understand what this passage is about, now go back with me to Romans 3. If you understand what this pa passage is about, you understand how that the prayer and the confession and all that stuff back here is not the point. Now what you need to do and what I need to do is be sure that we have our mind keyed on what is the point. The heart, Paul says that the gospel was, which was committed to me was how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was buried and rose again the third day and was seen. Two doctrines and two, two evidences. One, he, he died for our sins, according to the Scripture. He was buried, proof that he died. He was raised again, according to the Scripture, doctrine. And he was seen, proof that he was resurrected. You have physical, demonstrative, historical proof to the historical facts of his death and his resurrection. And Paul says what his death meant is that he died for your sins. What his resurrection meant is, he, is it for your justification, Romans 4.25. So the meaning of his death and resurrection is all laid out for you clearly in Romans 3. Starts in verse 19 where he's concluding the first three chapters when he says now, we, uh, ver, in fact, verse number 9, he says, What then, uh, Romans 3 9, we're, are we better than they? No and no wise. We have before proved, both Jew and Gentile, that they're all under sin. And as is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Paul has offered a legal brief to prove everybody's under sin. Jew, Gentile, bond free, male, female, doesn't make a difference who you are. You're all in the same boat. You're lost. He writes three chapters to do that. Then he says in verse 19, Now we know that the whole, that what sort of things the law saith, it saith to them under who, who, who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. If he gave you the law to stop your mouths, then he didn't give you the law to make you pray and confess. To stop your mouth means you don't pray, you don't confess. But what am I supposed to do? Believe. <laughs> See, that's not your mouth, that's your heart. But now that verse 21, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference for all of sin and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now we're in Ephesians 2, 8 again. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation, the fully satisfying payment through faith in His blood. God the Father has faith in the blood of His Son to be the satisfaction for your sin and debt and my sin debt. Now, if God the Father believes that, what should I do? Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He, that is God the Father, might be just and justifier of Him which prays the sinner's prayer, believes in Jesus. You see, it's by grace through faith. And that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You just believe in Jesus. You just believe that Jesus Christ, that His blood paid for all of your sin debt, that it settled every issue between you and God, and you place your trust, you place your dependence exclusively in Him. And then as a saved, justified person, you call on Him over and over and over and over. Why? Because you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have access in Him with boldness and confidence. 
based upon His blood. You see, when you begin to add that religious twist at the end of it, because Romans 1 verse 16, and I'm going to quit with this, shows you why this is real important. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. Where's the power of God to salvation? It's in the gospel of Christ, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised again for our justification. It's in the fact that God set him forth to be the propitiation for our sins. But notice the rest of that. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. You see the proposition there? The way you get the gospel to be the power of God for salvation for you is you believe it. If you don't believe it, it's not the power of God of salvation for you. That's why it's important. Because if you come along and tell somebody that you got to work, then you told them belief wasn't enough. And grace isn't grace anymore because the only response grace will accept is faith. And grace requires faith as the only response. So if you tell somebody to pray or to confess or to walk an aisle, shake a preacher's hand, make deals, go do ceremonies, live a, live a life, turn away, you, you give them anything to do, even as simple as just praying to get saved. You substituted a work for faith. And the gospel is the power of God only to those who simply, exclusively believe in Jesus. And you literally, in the words of 1 Corinthians 1, make the cross of none effect. Where people can know all about the gospel, know all about the cross, and it have no impact in their life. Why? Because they didn't simply believe it. Trust it. Depend on it exclusively. Okay? So why won't prayer save you? Because that's telling somebody to work. And salvation is not by works, it's by grace. Who prays? Believers. Who calls on the Lord? Believers. Why? Because we do believe. And as justified believers, as righteous people, we call, as saints, we call on Him. And we do pray. Not to get saved, but because we are saved. The first prayer a, a saved person should pray is to say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. you got no problem with that. I'm not trying to tell you, no, don't pray when you get saved. I'm telling you, don't pray to get saved. Pray because you are saved. You get saved by believing. You need to keep your mind, you need to keep your ears tuned like a laser. And just like your tongue can taste the difference in meat, your ear needs to be able to hear that message because, listen, if you listen to the Christian radio, you read Christian literature, you watch Christian television, it's, it's designed, it's intent, it's a result is to dull your hearing so that you aren't sharp about that. Because your flesh would like to do anything it can, the religious system would like to do anything it can, the adversary would like to do anything to hide the gospel of God's grace. And you and I need to be careful that we don't fall into that trap ourselves. Okay? You're here today, you've never trusted Christ. <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to make deals with God. You don't even have to pray. You just trust Him. And God will save you. And then you tell Him you're trusting His Son and you thank Him that that gives you everlasting life. But you don't do that to get it. You do it because you got it. Amen? All right, now you're going to get to go out and brave the cold. I look out that window and it's snowing. Those air conditioners, Tuesday had about two feet on it, Wednesday had about two feet, now they got about three feet on them. So, uh, you know, enjoy the afternoon. We will be back here at 6 o'clock tonight, so, you know, if you're hale and hearty and well met, come back and enjoy it. If not, watch on the Internet, okay? I'm proud of you for being here this morning. You're, you're the... You're the uh, you're willing to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, right? All right, Carl's going to come lead us in a song.